Good evening and uh, welcome to Behind the Headlines. Uh, today is Wednesday the 6th of October 2021 and in this programme tonight we'll be discussing how China and uh, Russia have been developing um, hypersonic missiles that also carry a warhead known as an EMP, which according to my own notes is electromagnetic pulse um, that have, could effectively disable major cities in the West, including London, New York or Paris. And uh, we'll also be talking about the posturing of uh, China uh, over Taiwan and uh, that uh, we could see a growing conflict or a potential Chinese invasion of Taiwan. And um, also I'd like to thank uh, Sylvia Dyson for this program because uh, she sent me this big article saying the energy crisis offers a taste of a future war, which uh, gave me the idea for this program. Um, so thank you very much, Sylvia. And uh, Reagan, it's uh, great to see you on, on Behind the Headlines. And um, yeah. I just think this is such an important topic uh, to cover. Now, this program is called Behind the Headlines, mm. but I haven't seen any headlines discussing this particular issue. Um, there has been a few articles, but I think, mm. I don't know, because of COVID-19 and because of other social issues, our mainstream media is, is not really focusing on the potential conflict that we could see in Taiwan uh, that could lead into a kind of wider conflict and also these frightening missiles that the Chinese and the Russians have developed. Uh, the North Koreans say they've tested two of them two weeks ago called... Um, hypersonic missiles and then the Americans also have them as well which are complete game changers when it comes to to warfare. Well unfortunately Simon we're seeing at the moment a definite arms race between nations to see who can develop this next generation variety of weaponry so uh, we have uh, China North Korea very active and it's part of the process of escalation in any context where there's distrust, you have um, some, someone come up with uh, a, a particular weapon, well the, the next group have to equal that or go one up. And so we're in this constant back and forth, back and forth, who can outdo one another in um, the devices of war. Now as, as for the headlines, you're exactly right. And I think it's extremely troubling that we have in our society at the moment, a total apathy towards the bigger picture. We're consumed with small stories, some stories that shouldn't even be really news, dominate our headlines. And then stuff like um, China, Russia as well, North Korea, developing electromagnetic pulse weaponry is consigned often to online articles on uh, in, in tabloid or other papers rather than people dealing seriously with the reality that this could cause catastrophic damage to our world, to, to our society. It, it, it sent us back to the Stone Age. Well, we're I mean, talking blackouts. Yeah, well, more than blackouts. I mean, we're, we're talking about um, uh, taking out our whole entire electricity um, supplies. Mm. This means uh, all the electric grid would be taken out. This means that the internet would, would, um, would cease to operate. Yeah. That means that uh, we wouldn't be able to get fuel, we wouldn't be able to get food, and because everything is digital, this would just bring our digital world to a complete collapse. And knowing that supermarkets only have mm -hmm. three day supply of food, with the, uh, with the electricity going down, we would have, we'd have food shortages. I mean, we're saying we've got food shortages now, but this would be on a scale that we've never seen before. Yep. We would have rioting and lawlessness in our streets. We'd have total panic. And our whole modern world would just essentially fall apart overnight. Uh, and we'd be in complete darkness and devastation. No electricity, no lighting, no heating, no food, no water. Um, and our whole modern life would, would come to an end mm. with these uh, very dangerous weapons known as EMPs.
It definitely would. And we would have looting. There would be, if you think about stuff that might not immediately come to mind, hospital machinery going out, um, operations having to stop mid-operation. There would be catastrophic loss of life. All communication systems breaking down, air, air traffic control, um, also, you know, um, any airplanes likely as well. Um, ha having to make emergency landings through gliding. I mean, th th there would be immense loss of life. But um, this is the perfect way of waging war against another nation um, w without actually causing um, obliteration of buildings and, you know, the, the, the mass uh, obliteration of a whole city. Um, this is different, f different from um, your prototypical nuclear warfare. Um, it, it's not really creating in and of itself a wasteland. It, it's still keeping basic infrastructure um, sound, but it's causing total anarchy and chaos. Uh, it's the perfect way to crash an economy. It's the perfect way to drive a society into anarchy and watch it tear itself apart. No, absolutely. So just to remind you, we are live and we are interactive tonight. So the big question for tonight's program is, could we face a Chinese EMP missile attack? And uh, we will um, expand upon this more and more as we go through the program. Um, in this article that uh, Sylvia sent me, um, there's an excellent title here. It's called... Um, the energy crisis offers a taste of a future war. And this is what uh, Con Cochrane writes, who is uh, the Telegraph's defence editor. He writes this, that the energy crisis offers a taste of future war, uh, in which he compares the current fuel crisis and its panic has caused to what would happen if one of our enemies carried a high-tech attack on our crucial infrastructure. Uh, he goes on to write that knocking out one, one of the country's electricity and water supplies or crippling its financial services could inflict more damage than a conventional military attack and this would cause massive civil unrest on our streets. And that's a cyber attack. That's not uh, an MEP attack. Uh, he also goes on to say that there, we're also noticing there's current arms race going on for these hypersonic missiles that the Chinese and the Russians are developing, and uh, including the Americans. Mm. The, the, there's a, a really good article written by Patrick Knox. This was, I believe, um, for the Sun newspaper. Oh, um, and the title was Blackout Bomb. It was published um, very recently, and it says that China is developing um, th this EMP missile in such a way. It, um, it, it can travel at 4,600 miles per hour. Uh, it's hypersonic. It, it can plunge cities into darkness, which we've already spoken about through um, s sending, uh, through a chemical explosion, which creates short but severe electromagnetic uh, pulses, uh, wiping out infrastructure. Um, Mr. Knox writes that Chinese scientists are developing a hypersonic weapon that generates an electromagnetic pulse that could wipe out communications, electricity, power plants. Uh, with a range of 2,000 miles, so you know, the f fairly significant range for um, these missiles as well. It can travel at six times the speed of sound, and it's designed to create a chemical uh, explosion over major cities like London, Manchester, Glasgow, um, that would uh, disable everything within seconds. Researchers at China's Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology in Beijing state that this missile would stay within the Earth's atmosphere to dodge space, um, sp space's early warning system. So um, it, it can evade radar to a great degree as well through, um, as, as it's traveling through space because of its speed, it develops it's under, sort of, under the yeah, under space, and, and, it, and it, it develops a plasma layer on the outside, a thin plasma layer that um, absorbs the radar, uh, ra radar beams and, and technology so that it, it's undetectable. So before you know, there's no way it can be uh, responded to. Uh, I mean, we said it's 4,600 miles an hour uh, uh, that they're looking at developing, but um, there's actually uh, e even faster rockets that R Russia is involved in um, producing 
um, that fit the same bill that are EMPs as well, um, even up, up to I saw something like 21 Oh, no. a thousand miles an hour something it was, yeah. it's, it's, it's just uh, insane uh, it's almost unthinkable absolutely incredible so according to this then according to my notes here it says that uh, once the missile is over its target use london for an example um a, uh, a chemical explosion uh, takes place that would trigger the electronic magnetic pulse that would effectively burn out key electrical devices within the range of two kilometers so looking at our crucial infrastructure internet networks, phone networks, electricity power plants, water supply, food supplies, energy supplies, effectively taking us back to the pre-industrial revolution. And also what makes this uh, weapon so deadly that if it was fired at London, uh, we would not know about it, as you mentioned earlier, because of the, the speed that mm. would travel through, the fact that it would actually dodge radar. Uh, and according to notes here, this, it travels at speed at hyper velocity, Air molecules are ionized by the heat that form a thin plasma, as you, you said, over, over the missile, which can absorb radar signals. Yep. Now, this is kind of extraordinary technology that, that's being developed. And we know, for example, that with the Chinese, that um, the reason that they have built themselves up into a world superpower is because they've pretty much stolen the West technology. Yep. So there's no doubt that this technology would probably be stolen probably from the Americans, and then they've developed and invested the huge amounts of money into this project mm. in order to have these weapons. Now, you know, when we look at China today, China does want to see itself as a world superpower. It wants to overtake the United States as the primary world superpower on the world stage. And I think because, of, because of COVID-19 and this situation and a, a weak president in Biden, this is exactly what we've got. Uh, we've got uh, a, a very good and very interesting um, CBN news report to go to now uh, that uh, looks at this uh, Star Wars project and the development of hi uh, hypersonic missiles um, that could deliver an MEP warhead. Pentagon top brass are now considering the use of space-based laser weapons as the ultimate solution to missile threats. The timing is due to the growing concern over Russia and China's increased technology in hypersonic missiles, the kind of attack that experts say would currently leave the United States vulnerable. The challenge with hypersonic vehicles is to know that they are headed your way from several thousand kilometers out in time to get your defending asset into the battle space. Michael Griffin, Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, says $20 billion would allow us to build a network of 1,000 missile interceptors that would be launched from satellites. In last year's defense authorization, Congress directed the Pentagon to draw proposals for space-based missile defenses. Griffin says China has conducted dozens of tests of a new hypersonic missile designed to strike the United States. He adds Russia is also developing this kind of technology. Current ground and sea-based defense sensors are not designed to detect these missiles that can travel at speeds over 7,000 miles per hour. Unlike current ballistic missiles, hypersonic weapons fly into space and return to Earth's atmosphere in unpredictable trajectories. Only space-based sensors can spot these threats early enough to shoot them down. You can't see it, you can't shoot it. If you don't know where it is, I don't really care how many interceptors you've got, they're totally ineffective. And the, the best place to do that from where we, what we can see as the threat matures, especially for the hypersonic threat, is from space. The United States is facing the greatest danger, I believe, in my professional lifetime of now some 40 years. Frank Gaffney of the Center for Security Policy says we have allowed U.S. defense capabilities to weaken while our enemies have built up their abilities to attack us. And the Chinese and Russians are doing this with research and technology pioneered by the U.S. The emergence of the danger from Russia and China with respect to these advanced nuclear missiles uh, combined with our diminished capability to deter their use against us is creating an immense danger, and I don't think enough Americans are aware of it. Gaffney says the American people need to know this information and urge their representatives in Washington to act. Only then the U.S. military can put this technology in place and stop a hypersonic missile. Eric Rosales, CBN News, Washington. 
Well, we can look across the past couple of centuries and we can see how there's r routinely an arms race between um, the various world powers, only you have to go back to last century and you see uh, the big players then were the US, the UK, Germany, and Russia. And we still have um, re really the US, the UK, Russia are, are pretty heavily in involved in in this, but now we have, um, in addition, China, which is sweeping across the world in terms of its e economic power. It is in, inarguably outweighs the United States at the moment in um, its uh, economic power that it's um, it, it's weighing in on. Uh, that's been amplified through COVID. Now we have North Korea joining in um, this massive and extremely dangerous arms race, um, as well as uh, Putin um, in Russia. Um, we can look at, I suppose you could say, a modern day axis of evil in many ways. You have um, Putin in Russia, you have Xi Jinping in, um, in, in China, you have um, uh, North, North Korea that's there. Uh, Putin has boasted of their hypersonic missiles Carry, capable of carrying nuclear warheads, which can fly at nearly 21,000 miles per hour, which can hit anywhere in minutes. Just, you know, th think of that, 21,000 miles an hour. We're, we're not... You can't comprehend it, can you? No, I mean, L L London is in its sights in that sense. Washington, D.C. is in it, it, its sights. So you, we kind of have to have this scenario, this situation where... Uh, we're always keeping up, and what the video we, we just saw we, was showing, what it made very clear is the U.S. in many ways have, has gone to sleep on its enemies. It's, it's gotten into this state of indifference or apathy or inactivity where our pioneer technology, we've allowed to hand, uh, we, we've allowed or we've handed over to, um, to those nations which do not have the United States, um, and, and for that matter, the United Kingdom, in their goodwill, uh, which, is, which is very, very troubling. No, absolutely, of course it is. But this has also come because America is incredibly weak right now. Uh, America has mm. an incredibly weak president. <coughs> but you can see that really, that what we're seeing really in the West is the same kind of uh, internal um, moral struggles that the old Roman Empire had that led to its collapse. It was moral and social decay mm. that, that caused the destruction of the Roman Empire. So in the same way, we're seeing exactly the same thing. I mean, what we're seeing now, for example, in the, in the US military under Biden, is that conservatives and Bible-believing Christians and others are being shifted and rooted out of the military. So when you see those things happening, we know that the, the United States has lost its moral grounding. I also see that, um, that a guy called Peter Pry, uh, who, according to the article in, in The Sun, was, the f was a former CIA director and is now a director of the EMP, a task force on national and homeland security, said this. He said that China is on the verge of deploying or has already de uh, developed hypersonic weapons that could potentially be armed with nuclear or non-nuclear EMP warheads, greatly increasing the threat of a surprise attack against the US forces in the Pacific and against the United States. Um, so there we see that this is a very clear and present danger that not only Britain faces, but the Western world faces and they need to kind of wake up because we are in incredibly dangerous and precarious times and we also got to understand as well as, as we're discussing this program that uh, our modern life is incredibly fragile mm. that it's uh, effectively built on on chips uh, and technology and this over reliance upon technology that uh, if there was a an emp attack this would completely destroy yeah our kind of Western civilization. It would destroy everything that we know from everything being built with the use of the internet, with emails, everything. So all everything that we know now today in 2021 um, could be destroyed overnight. So much manufacturing through robotics and, and whatnot, it will all, all cease and um, people will not 
have the same mathematical, uh, mathematical engineering know-how in many cases to do things manually. So um, there'll be a lot of relearning to get to grips with. Uh, a lot of this is echoed in some of the emails that are coming through. We have uh, this from Chris. Hi guys, from Chris in Ireland, another great topic. This is a typical example of the foolishness of owning a digital currency like Bitcoin or any similar currency. The scripture says in one day it all will come to nothing. Uh, that sounds like uh, EMP to me. I was never a believer in the digital currency craze. We need to make the Lord our only source. I mean, in, indeed, Chris, you know, if we have situations like this, there's not going to be. It's not just Bitcoin though that people won't have access to. They won't have access to ATMs apart from perhaps with a hammer and a crowbar, and then <laughs> and then it will. Oh, no, of course, our, I mean, our government <laughs> wants to fade out cash anyway. Well, um, so you know, no money. This is all foolishness. Available. Yeah, but this but this is what modern life is. Uh, and this is why uh, we're going to conclude the program with uh, what Jesus said about uh, choosing to build your house upon the rock rather than the sand. And also I think this is also prophetically connected um, to uh, Daniel uh, chapter 2. Um, and the, the last empire will be the statue of the feet that's mixed with iron and clay. It's going to be strong but it's also going to be extremely weak and fragile at the same time. And with the economic infrastructure that we're building, um, everything that's digitally online and our reliance on technology means that our world is incredibly fragile. And I think this is the point that we want to make, a, a, make in this program very, very strongly, that the Chinese and the Russians are developing such weapons we know that uh, the, the British government probably could do more to kind of step up its cyber intelligence task force to counter these threats. But if we face one of these missiles, do we have the military capabilities to shoot one mm. down when they're not being picked up by radar? Mm. Um, Kevin says, hi lads, the system that is running the world is on a knife edge, very much what you're saying, the state of fragility. I personally believe there's a lot going on that we don't see. I pray for people to wake up and ask Jesus into their lives before it is too late. Many will think I am an alarmist. I, am, I think not. My peace is not shaken as Jesus is in my heart. Call on Jesus and ask for life eternal before it all collapses and hell is unleashed. Safety is only in Jesus. Thanks for showing the truth, which hopefully will wake some up. Keep going, lads. Thank you for that, Kev. Um, we have this from Tony. Bring it up. Um, Tony says, Dear Simon, the Chinese EMP missiles are very frightening weapons derived from the EMP effect from nuclear weapon detonations. Uh, perhaps Albert Einstein said it best many years ago in 1947. Professor Einstein was asked by friends at a dinner party what new weapons might be employed in World War III. Appalled at the implications, he shook his head. After several minutes of meditation, he said, I don't know what weapons might be used in World War III, but there isn't any doubt what weapons would be used in World War IV. And what are those? A guest asked. Stone spears, said Einstein. Tony. Interesting. Very prophetic, yeah. extremely prophetic, and um, I mean, effectively, what one one of these does, and it, unfortunately, I couldn't find a video to actually show it, but a missile would actually, f one of these um, EMP missiles, uh, would actually fly over a major city, say for example London, and, and and then set off these electronic pulses, which would then completely disable all the uh, all the electricity and everything's associated with the electricity, the internet, and everything else that's connected to it. And literally within seconds, it will just, just actually go out, uh, which is a very kind of frightening uh, scenario and very frightening prospect. Anita says, hi Simon and Reagan, lovely to see you both. We face so many threats now that this is a distinct possibility. And there was a sci-fi drama depicting what would happen if the electricity and everything went down. It wasn't good. Everything is computerized now. We can no longer do anything without technology. The US, UK, and other nations need to look at developing a defense. We have Iran, China, North Korea, and Russia to worry about. None of these countries can be trusted, so anything could happen. I'm just praying all will be well. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And indeed, Anita, as we continue to um, go towards the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, there will be there will come grave times of difficulty. Um, there will be, and we see in the, the scriptures, it says for those who are with child or nursing at the time, it will be incredibly 
um, difficult. There'll be Im immense devastation um, that will be wracked. There'll be fearful and terrifying days. And yeah, our hope is in, in Christ Jesus and we know that we uh, have a wonderful message to give to people that salvation is found in Him if only people will, will come to Him. No, absolutely. So earlier today, I uh, recorded a Zoom interview with uh, Major General Tim Cross, uh, who was very uh, high up in the British Army. He's a, he's a born-again Christian. And um, this was his perspective on uh, China and Russia developing these hypersonic missiles that could carry an MEP warhead. Uh, we're now joined on Behind the Headlines by uh, Major General Tim Cross. Uh, Tim, uh, warm welcome to the programme. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Pleasure. And um, Tim, what do you make of uh, the Chinese developing a new hypersonic missile that has the capability of carrying an MEP warhead known as a magnetic electronic pulse weapon? Yeah. Um, it goes by different abbreviations. Some call it an EMP, electronic uh, magnetic pulse and so on. Actually, uh, we've got to be careful about spoiler alerts, alerts but the new Bond movie has a, had a particular watch that does something associated with this, you may remember. Um, <laughs> but in, uh, in, you know, people realised that the result of a nuclear explosion fairly quickly after they'd uh, um, done all of the trials and so forth before they, you know, before the end of World War II, that if you, if you, if you blow up a nuclear weapon, in the atmosphere above the earth it does generate this electromagnetic pulse and that will um, destroy all electronics uh, all um, computer systems and everything related to that really so we know it works we know it can happen the people have talked about developing it for quite a long time um, but it's not easy and this you know it is obviously a nuclear weapon that is that is used to generate this emp so there are lots of other issues associated with it. The Chinese are overall, are, it's, very, it's a very interesting period of history. China, President Xi carries a lot of baggage and, and is determined to bring China into being a major world power um, and uh, is trying to throw off what he sees as, uh, you know, a couple of hundred years worth of the West um, abusing China really. So part of getting Hong Kong, part of getting Taiwan, we'll talk about later, uh, part of developing these uh, strong naval assets and the islands in the South China Sea and all of this military piece linked to the development of hypersonic missiles and this EMP is part of that overall picture. So it's a serious threat. There's no doubt about that. He's, he's developing the capability. Every move in weapons technology always brings with it usually in fairly quick order in historical terms, some sort of counter technology or counter capability. I did a guided weapons master's degree course and uh, subsequently did guided weapons appointments in the military back in 1982. And, you know, we've moved on an awful long way since then. But if you go back in history, then the development of the bow and arrows met by the development of the shield and the development of you know, weapons in all sorts of guises, particularly anti-tank weapons and so forth. You develop weapons that will penetrate tank armor, so you build different tanks with thicker armor or better mobility or whatever. So there's always a counter technology being developed. And there's two aspects to this. One is hardening your systems so they're protected against EMP. And the other one, of course, is having a capability of your own, which simply acts as a deterrent, which simply says, if you hit us with this weapon, we can hit you back. Um, and our nuclear submarine capability um, and other capabilities can be brought into play on that. So it is a serious threat. Um, I think it's something we need to definitely take seriously. Um, and to be fair, the government are taking it seriously uh, alongside other things like cyber and AI. So um, I don't think it's, I don't think, you know, they're, they're not going to have a, a capable system that they will deploy and be capable of using, I don't think, for some time yet but it will arrive and we need to have thought this through how we're going to counter it. No, absolutely. Um, as, a, a, as a military man, can you tell us what the devastation will do if one of these hypersonic uh, EMPs is actually launched on our capital cities such as London and uh, uh, take out our electricity and key vital uh, infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, it, it's important to realise that the, the distinction between this weapon and a normal conventional weapon, or indeed a nuclear weapon, is you're not causing physical destruction. 
what you're tackling is the, is the national infrastructure that enables us all to live and do our stuff. So the whole of the electricity power supply system, the whole of our communication system, you know, the Zoom that we're using now, mobile phone technology, the, the ability to move water through the, through the system, um, et cetera, et cetera. All of the essentials that we use day by day. And the impact would be pretty severe pretty quickly. I mean, we've only, you know, we're just living through the last 10 days of a, you know, relatively minor problem of not being able to suck fuel out of a supply chain quickly enough to meet demand even though we know there's enough fuel in there. What this would do would, would make sure you couldn't physically move the stuff through the supply chain in different ways. Vehicles would be, modern, modern vehicles are, you know, got, and we know that you know, new car sales have gone down because the chips aren't available uh, to, on the production line. So those chips would be taken out in terms of an EMP. So a lot of our vehicles wouldn't work. Um, so it doesn't take much, you know, you don't need to get into sort of Hollywood um, you know, awful films and things to begin to imagine that what this impact would have day to day. And um, how you harden everything against that is not easy, actually, for the big national infrastructure, your nuclear power stations, your electricity supply chains, your national grid and so forth. That is something that, um, you know, we would need to do. Absolutely. Uh, and how would the uh, British government and the British military respond to such an EMP attack on London or Manchester or Glasgow? Well, we talk about weapons of mass destruction, and historically that has been gas, which was used in the First World War, and obviously Saddam Hussein used it against the Kurds and so on. Uh, chemical attack, which the, Wash the Russians have used to some degree in this country, and has certainly been used in places like Syria, and of course nuclear weapons. Those things are collectively weapons of mass destruction. Now, there are those who argue that cyber is a weapons of mass destruction, and EMP would would fall sort of loosely under that umbrella, but even if you separate the two. Why? Because of the scale of the destruction that it brings. So we have well understood uh, deterrence and um, you know, UN charters and, and, and UN resolutions and so forth that, that say people should not use weapons of mass destruction. Now, as I've just said, we know they've been used in places like Syria uh, as, and elsewhere. So the reality is, uh, that if you get the sort of people that sadly rule these places, be it North Korea, be it, um, you know, uh, the um, Iraq or Iran or, um, you know, various other countries, um, the Hitlers, the Stalins, and so forth, would they be prepared to use this weapon? Well, I, I think they would. And therefore, we have to have a clear capability of defending ourselves, but we also have to have this offensive capability to act as a deterrent. Now, like the nuclear deterrent, there are plenty of people around who would say, well, if we were really hit with a nuclear weapon, would we genuinely retaliate with another nuclear weapon and kill millions of people? And one of the issues of strategic deterrence theory is uncertainty, is the we do not know how this will pan out, uh, the whole of the, the escalation ladder that we used to talk about during the Cold War and so on. So we have to have, we have, to have a way of sending a message that says, if you do this to us, we have the capability and the will to respond. Um, now, what that looks like in, in the context of UK on its own, within the NATO alliance, within the Western powers in the round, um, you know, is a, is a broader issue. Um, but taken, you know, at one end of the spectrum, and in terms of deterrence theory, the UK response has to be at least prior to this attack, that we are prepared to respond if you do this to us. And um, Tim, can you describe for us what these uh, uh, news reports are calling hypersonic weapons? We know that uh, the Russians have them, the Chinese have them, the Americans have them. And uh, up until two weeks ago, we now realise that North Koreans have them. Um, how dangerous are these weapons and what makes them different from conventional ballistic missiles? Yeah, going back to my earlier point, the, these developments in weapon systems go on over time and, and guided weapons that I was dealing with in 1982 were relatively slow. Um, and we now have much faster missiles on our Navy ships and uh, air launched and so on. Hypersonic is simply a weapon that travels at an, a multiple times the speed of sound. So Concorde was a supersonic capability because it, it, you know, it flew across the Atlantic above the sea, speed of sound. Now, in terms of weapons, our, our radar systems and our counter systems um, can cope with airplanes flying at Mach 2, Mach 3. 
when you come to a guided when you come to a missile which is obviously smaller than a than an aircraft in in, in most most cases and its ability to travel at six or seven times the speed of sound then the ability to detect it and then do something about it is clearly and pretty obviously much more difficult um, it doesn't leave generally speaking it doesn't leave the atmosphere it stays inside uh, the atmosphere but it can still be picked up by radar but it's going very very fast so our radar technologies have to be developed in order to detect that sort of capability the other aspect though is remembering that any guided weapon of any sort is always a balance between the amount of fuel you've got to carry to to, to uh, get this thing going the amount of payload you can carry in terms of the weapon system you're delivering and the rest of the stuff like the guided the guided electronics guidance electronics and so on now, the guidance electronics nowadays are much smaller than, and again, even when I was dealing with this. Um, the payload, if you're putting out a sort of EMP, then you're talking about a relatively small tactical sized nuclear weapon. But, uh, you know, obviously, if you're using a relatively small thing, the impact of the EMP it produces is relatively limited. So, we, you know, we've got to be careful about thinking a single weapon will take out the whole of the um, critical infrastructure of London, for example. You know, that would have to be a pretty sizable explosion. So it's flying at, uh, at, at supersonic speeds, six or seven times the speed of sound, and uh, it has to be directed and it has to carry a payload. Now, I know these nations have said they've got it. I think we do need to be careful about what we assume the Koreans particularly are capable of doing. Um, there's no doubt the Americans are developing this technology and the Russians and the Chinese too. But again, um, you know, the ability to counter it is important and the ability to, cap to carry our own, our, own, uh, our own deterrent capability. The other thing about this is that we mustn't just assume either that hypervelocity weapons, and people use this in the context of, for example, of aircraft carriers are now redundant because of hypervelocity missiles. Well, that's not true. I mean, you know, China's developing hypervelocity missiles, but it's also developing new aircraft carriers. Uh, Russia is too. Other nations are developing aircraft carriers. And aircraft carriers don't just sail along on their own. They have a protective system of other ships, frigates, destroyers. They have their own capabilities of defending themselves uh, with modern weapon systems that are much more capable than they were, you know, even 20 or 30 years ago. So again, like all these conversations, it's about the technology, the counter technology and the tactics that you use in order to try to defeat that technology. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not pretending for one minute these aren't serious advances. In, in fact, in many ways, uh, cyber, hypersonic, AI, data are, you know, really big, significant changes that are going on at the moment. In the command paper that the UK MOD put out earlier this year, they talked about the, if you like, the demise of the sunset technologies, classic weapon systems as we understand them, tanks and, you know, high not large numbers of stuff if you like and, and a move from sunset technologies to sunrise technologies and the sunrise technologies are exactly what we're talking about cyber data ai and so on and that is exactly where we're going and the argument is that you don't need the same mass that you had previously because these systems can be operated in in lots of different ways with, with far less capability and there's truth in that but i have to say but there's also truth and a, a critical mass of kit below which if you fall, uh, you stand in danger. You can't move petrol down a pipeline using data and AI. You, yeah. you know, and you need soldiers, as we know, now at the other end, helping to shift it. So the balance between the two is not easy, but you know, it's definitely a big change. And um, the Chinese are saying that by 2025, they will have sufficient capability here um, to, for example, take on Taiwan. Uh, and that's my, my last and final question to you. Uh, what do you make of uh, Chinese belligerence over the island of Taiwan? Uh, according to last weekend, for example, 77 Chinese fighter and bomber planes flew into Taiwanese airspace. Um, yeah. And can you see that potentially uh, an inv Chinese invasion of Taiwan, and could this then lead into a kind of wider global conflict with the West? Well, anything is possible, of course. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, President Xi is determined, particularly by the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party, to have regained what he sees as sovereignty over Taiwan, having got Hong Kong back, and restored Chinese integrity. 
So he's serious about this. There's no doubt about it. And these incursions into airspace and indeed sea space, uh, in fact, I think the numbers are now above 100 um, that have gone on over the last you know, couple, of, couple of months anyway. Um, you know, they are, they are an indicator, if you like. Now, China has, incur had, has arranged for incursions of Taiwan into airspace and sea space over a long time, normally in response to something that the Taiwanese have done or the US has done. That might be an arms deal, it might be an exercise, it might be something that Chinese feel they need to respond to. Um, there's, there's nothing significant the Taiwanese or the Americans actually have done uh, in this context, but I have to say we, the UK, have. We've just, we've just sent a destroyer down through the, through the Taiwanese Straits. We've got a carrier group operating in that region alongside with a US ship, with a, with a Dutch ship, the Australians and Japanese and others are exercising with us, so are the Indians. So we've got quite a naval presence in the region and we've been showing and demonstrating that capability. So this part of me is quite clear that what China is doing is saying, you know, we know what you're getting up to and here's just to show you that we are, we are perfectly capable of, um, you know, ramping up if you like. Now, that said, uh, just think back to D-Day and how long it took us to prepare for D-Day and the amount of stuff we needed to get relatively small numbers of people across a relatively small piece of water, as in 20 miles or so. Probably a bit longer than that to Normandy uh, rather than Dover to Calais, but you know, the, the, China, uh, the Taiwanese Straits are much bigger than the, the English Channel. And to move the sort of numbers of people that they would need to move to, to secure a beachhead and to be able to hold on to it and so forth, uh, you know, is a major undertaking. It would, it would be a, well, it is, it would be a major undertaking. And um, the Taiwanese have got very capable, um, you know, aircraft and ships and, and defense forces and so on. They've got strong alliances with other people in the region. The US have made it quite clear that they would stand by them, although there is a question about Biden in terms of, or President Biden in terms of this latest business with Afghanistan. So, Major Tim Cross, thank you so much for your incredible expertise and, and insight into this subject. And thank you so much for your contribution to the program. It's been a pleasure to host you on uh, Behind the Headlines. You're very welcome. Bye bye now. Thank God you. bless. Well, we're very thankful for that stellar interview there um, with Simon and Major. Uh, Tim there. Here's a couple of emails. Uh, Dear Simon and Reagan, looks like all electric vehicles would be driving to a permanent cul-de-sac if EMP weapons were in the hands of our enemies. I like Ivan's way with words there and indeed questions have to be asked and we're making the world even more reliant on um, electricity than we have been before. We've talked before about how this could already cause pressure on the systems, but imagine with an EMP, then it just all goes kaput. Um, Maggie says, I used to be uh, worried about EMP attacks, but when you think of it logically, China would not gain anything by destroying its customers in the West. China needs us far more than we need them. We, we do actually owe China quite a lot of money and we keep borrowing from them so uh, they might dispute that a little bit and their economy is based wholly on selling its goods to the west and its economy has been hit hard by covid china is not doing as well as was predicted a couple of years ago which um, is true there was two years ago a, a slew of articles about their quest for global domination and how they were going about it uh, indeed, after COVID, it looked like they might be succeeding, but there has been a decent economic recovery. The thing is, uh, with this, uh, Maggie, you know, we, we, we have multiple nations who are developing these EMPs. And in many ways, Simon, it reminds me of uh, the MAD, MAD policy, mutually assured destruction that we've talked about in the past. Each of these world superpowers is having to develop these hypersonic um, w weapons in order to compete with one another and basically scare the other into not firing its weapon for fear of retaliation. So um, we're, we're gleaning technology. At some point, though, one of these countries is going to press the button 
and it's going to happen. I mean, just consider some of what's going on in Russia at the moment. We already mentioned that they've developed a hypersonic missile capable of carrying nuclear warheads that can fly 21,000 miles an hour. Um, that this particular uh, missile, the Zircon, was unleashed at a speed at Mach 7, uh, a land target from the frigate Admiral Gorshkov in the White Sea off the northwest coast of Russia. The Zircon has been identified by Moscow's state-controlled TV as Putin's weapon of choice to wipe out coastal American cities in the event of a nuclear conflict. So, I mean, they've already set their sights. They already have their targets in mind. The Kremlin also has in its armory the 21,000 mile an hour avant-garde hypersonic glide vehicle, which it reportedly brought into service in 2019. China alone has plowed an extra 151 billion, eye-watering sum, um, into military spending this year. That's just this year. Um, a 6.8% increase as it seeks to extend its claim over territory in the South China Sea. Um, North Korea has tested, much to many people's shock and horror, especially Japan's, a, um, two hypersonic missiles. They fired two hypersonic missiles to, um, you know, undergo the test and definitely to inspire shock and awe and fear in um, many of their enemies. But um, the issue with China, I think this brings us to this part of our discussion, China, where, um, Simon, um, where China is flexing its muscle in regard to Taiwan. Yeah, uh, but I want to take a step back because I think our, our, our viewer made a very interesting, is it Maggie made a very Maggie, yeah, interesting yeah. point on. that I'd like to counter. Um, because of China's uh, one-child policy means that their population now is a ticking time bomb and uh, they don't have enough women <coughs> in China to keep the population going. So they, pose, they face an existential threat. Mm. They also see themselves in a position to, uh, and have certainly been accelerated since Trump's been off the scene, with COVID-19 on the scene, they've seen that a lack of a... Uh, Western response to COVID, knowing that we know all the news reports and the intelligence reports that have come out all indicate that, uh, that there was a leak at the Wuhan um, lab mm -hmm. uh, back in September or October of 2020. So effectively what we're seeing then is China using the current world situation in order to take advantage of this and, and this is why it's developing a program called its Belt and Roads Infrastructure Program as a kind of Trojan horse to take over and control areas from China into Central Asia, into the Middle East and into Europe um, and so therefore they have global ambitions to actually dominate the world. And this is why they're developing, we discuss other programs such as developing these ideas of a super soldier. Um, and of course, what they want to do is flex their muscles, particularly when it comes to Taiwan, mm -hmm. uh, which, which is scary. So um, moving on to Taiwan, we could see a, an imminent uh, Chinese invasion of Taiwan, um, or what we could see, which would even be worse, is that China could actually unleash its uh, EMP uh, missiles to attack Taiwan, uh, and that would be frightening. But just to let you know this one, that the uh, government in Taiwan has told the world's media that it's preparing uh, for war with China, as uh, Beijing has deployed over 129 warplanes over the island. The Chinese state media-run Communist Party has called for Taiwan to be crushed. And uh, last weekend, a total of 77 Chinese fighter and bomber aircraft flew into Taiwan's airspace, known as Air Defence Identification Zone, uh, the ADIZ, uh, was the largest incursion by Chinese military aircraft. And then Monday, only two days ago, 52 planes, including nuclear bombers, flew into Taiwan airspace and uh, we have this uh, new CBN news report uh, to look at how China is increasingly becoming more and more belligerent towards Taiwan.
As Taiwan strives to maintain its independence, China is flexing its military muscle over the island with an implied ultimatum, war or loss of sovereignty. More than 145 Chinese military warplanes tested Taiwan's air defense over a four-day span and a year full of provocative military posturing. Well, we remain concerned by the People's Republic of China's provocative military activity near Taiwan, which is destabilizing, risks miscalculations, and undermines a regional peace and stability. The intimidation resumed Friday, October 1st, also the 72nd anniversary of China's communist state. Monday, we saw its largest incursion yet, flying 52 military aircraft across the Taiwan Strait. We know that China is testing the Biden administration because after the fall of Afghanistan, they said they were going to go after Taiwan and that the U.S. wasn't going to do anything about it. And I think that's actually what leaders in Beijing think. So this is an exceedingly dangerous situation. While analysts say it's not an imminent threat of war, earlier this year, the communist government pledged complete reunification with Taiwan, viewing it as a breakaway province that must be taken back. Taiwan's defense ministry rebuked the incursions, calling them brutal and barbaric, while the U.S. State Department called for the aggression to stop, saying, quote, we urge Beijing to cease its military, diplomatic and economic pressure and coercion against Taiwan. We have a policy called strategic ambiguity which means we don't tell anyone what we're going to do. That policy worked in a more um, peaceful time. It's not working now, which means we need to go to a policy of strategic clarity, telling China we will defend Taiwan. As tensions rise in the South Pacific, President Biden's alliance with Britain, Australia and Japan is working to share defense resources and supply Australia with nuclear-powered submarines to ensure a stronger, long-term military presence in the region. Our commitment to Taiwan is rock solid and contributes to the maintenance of peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait and within the region. The timing of China's forceful showing also comes while a strong NATO presence is patrolling nearby. It includes more than a dozen U.S., British and allied warships, including three aircraft carriers. Some see this not only as a message to Taiwan, but other world powers as well. Brody Carter, CBN News. So that is one to be watching out for to see uh, how things are going to escalate or de-escalate in regard to uh, China and Taiwan. We have another email here. This is from Stephen in Kirk Fergus. We have a nice castle in Kirk Fergus. Um, Simon Frank Gaffney says the U.S. is facing their greatest danger from China and Russia with these super missiles. I don't believe this is true. Wars and rumors of th these wars. I do believe that America is already weak because of the Biden administration and the Democrats' idiotic policies. So uh, we probably wouldn't be facing these dangers or we wouldn't be looking at them as severe were it not for some of these policies. Absolutely. Yeah. I the self-destruction. I mean, we've got to understand, I think, in, in concluding in the program, what made the West great? What made the West powerful? What made uh, uh, Great Britain, for example, to, to have an empire where they said that the sun never, set, mm. never uh, went down on the British Empire? And the reason is because of our Judeo-Christian heritage. When um, in the last century, when, uh, no, back in the, ninth, sorry, the 19th century, for example, uh, French diplomats said, what made America great? And they said it was the power of the American pulpits. It was the gospel uh, and Christianity that effectively gave the West its strength. And without that, we have no strength. And it very much uh, fits into to where we are with uh, Matthew 7, 24. Sadly, I don't have time to read it, but we see that our whole modern life is actually built upon the sand when we should actually be building the foundation of our Western civilization on the rock which is our Judeo-Christian heritage, which, which is Christ, which sadly um, we are not doing. And this is why our modern world, which is built on the sand, um, is so precarious. Uh, and uh, the, the threats now that we face from Russia and China are extremely frightening. So um, these are our warnings. And, uh, you know, it's also a warning to us all that we need to get right with the Lord. We need to get close to him because he's coming back soon. And uh, if you don't know him, then you should know him because the days that we're living in are increasingly precarious. So I want to thank you for watching Behind the Headlines.